Greetings and welcome to part two. Could blockchain and cryptocurrency be the most radical change in human civilization since the American Revolution and the Industrial Revolution? Hyperbole? Well, st stick with me, and uh, this will be a short little vignette. Really, it's almost more of a dispatch from the front. Blockchain and its family of technologies may have a direct massive political consequence by posing a threat to the very possibility of the centralization of power. But the technology itself will also have a massive effect on how daily business is conducted both in the real world and across those intersections with the emergent metaverse. And believe me, we'll be covering that. Blockchain synthesizes the technological and the political so seamlessly that the two are inseparable. And maybe that has always been true of the relationship between technology and politics, because inevitably technology is power, technology is knowledge, and the political can never be far behind. This is why we see blockchain's potential to decentralize the global financial system as not only a technological marvel, but also as a massive disruption to the global political spheres as well. Money itself is not the issue. Money means nothing. Money has no intrinsic value at all. Collect all the money in a nation, redistribute it equally throughout the population, within a few years the money will reallocate itself into basically the same hands and institutions that it's in right now. What is of importance is not money, but finance, the financial system. Those who control the system control the money. But of course, they created the money to represent those systems. Today, it's called the Federal Reserve and the Global Banking System. And the gatekeepers of the financial institutions can devalue and revalue the worth of money at will. The great socialist ruse of giving power and control to the people by giving them control over the means of production was always a ruse. Controlling the financial system controls the means of production. The people were never even educated under communist regimes as to what the financial system was and what institutions it consisted of. Of course not. The party controlled every aspect of the financial system, while the workers deluded themselves into thinking they controlled anything at all as they voted and labored within the factories. The workers were told what to make, how much to make, and what it was worth once it was made. How did this ever constitute a kind of ownership, a kind of power, as in power to the people? Marx knew this, and his relationships to the bankers of his time is what caused the real revolutionary of the people, Mikhail Bakunin, to be so suspicious of Marx and Engels. All financial systems are specifically designed to centralize, monopolize, regulate, and control, not just the money supply, which the system itself creates as a lubricant of the exchange system in the first place, but the totality of the means and venues of exchange. The financial system also establishes and controls the critical nodes of economic movement, the avenues and means of exchange at one end, and at the other end, the markets, where those movements come to rest and are evaluated. Control the means of exchange, and you control the means of production, directly or indirectly. So giving the workers control over the means of production meant absolutely nothing. And Marx knew that. Besides that, the global socialists abandoned the working classes, because capitalism had raised their standard of living to such a high level that socialism had nothing to offer them. So the betrayal of the working class was swift and deadly. It is continuing to this day. The opioid epidemic was never an unintended consequence. It is the financial system that establishes economic values in the first place, and the system does so by control and regulation. Control and regulation can only be established by centralization, and the socialist state whether it's called communist or fascist, is the ultimate in centralization. And the control and regulation of the economic process is an indispensable pillar of all political and military control. But as stated, money only represents the financial system. Money, whether purely paper fiat or minted in precious metals, delivers its actual value from the economic system it represents, not the other way around. All financial systems are designed deliberately as institutions for centralized control. Each financial system creates money, not the other way around. Each financial system creates money. Money does not create a financial system. The Federal Reserve creates money out of thin air. That is, it creates the symbols of value that they, the Federal Reserve, control through the banking system, which is at the heart of our present financial system. 
And it, the banks, through the Federal Reserve, can also devalue those symbols at will. Inflation is a technique. It's a technology. And Bitcoin is a real threat. Blockchain is a real threat. The Federal Reserve System is not as centralized as the financial system of the socialist state, yet, but it's not far behind. And that's the point. The globalists are rapidly in control of the banking system, and the university system has been under their control for decades. From the Ivy League schools to the halls of high finance, they have been graduating minions for, globalist socialist, for the globalist socialist state for 50 years now. Is it any wonder that they are everywhere? They have become so brazen that the Biden administration just nominated an overt communist for controller of the currency. The controller of the currency. A fiat currency. The controller of the currency of a capitalist nation. A communist. Does it get any richer than that? I mean, really, you got to hand it to him. It's, it's kind of beautiful in its own weird way. Perverse way. Furthermore, in any case you didn't already know, the Federal Reserve is not a federal institution. The Federal Reserve is an association of interrelated private banks. And recall that one of the characteristics of national socialism or fascism is the government control of capitalism, the government control of the financial system. It happens to be capitalism, but actually capitalism is the only financial system the communists understand at all. They don't have a substitute for it. They've never had a substitute for it. So it was always in their plan to control capitalism. They never intended to get rid of capitalism. And because of that, they never have. Look at every single communist nation. They have state-controlled capitalism. And so I conclude that the financial system, by its very existence, is a centralized system of control. You could argue the centralizing means of control, perhaps even more so than the military. So the DeFi, or decentralized finance, a decentralized financial system, should be in any historical context an oxymoron. But is it? Because something is inherently contradictory in language, does that mean it must be contradictory in reality? Of course not. Any mystic will tell you that even while any deconstructionist, postmodernist, will insist that reality itself is created socially via language or the magic of discourse, Human consciousness, much, much less reality itself, is hardly bound by something as flimsy as discourse. That is the kind of idiocy only a college graduate could fall for. Well, actually, that kind of idiocy was specifically designed for the college graduate. Decentralized finance is similar to declaring something to be a chaotic system. But an oxymoron in language only delineates what is at the limits of language. That is hardly a limit of reality. In mystical disciplines, going beyond language is not a final or even late stage of development. It's an early stage in any spiritual discipline. Stopping the language chattering of the mind is one of the first goals among any student of a mystical tradition. Reality is hardly bound by language, much less constructed by it. So just because the term decentralized financial system is an oxymoron in terms of language and meaning does not establish that a system of decentralized finance cannot exist especially if it rests on mathematics. Oh, and did you hear the meme that science is simply another post-colonial, mental post-colonial attack on the people of color? Or that it's uh, a generated discourse established by the patriarchy? Or some other blah, 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 blah. Believe me, the globalists trust science. They just don't want you to. And that's why they're so afraid of blockchain. Blockchain is mathematics, technology, science. And it's decentralized. And this is what brings us to blockchain and the emergence of a series of interlocking decentralized financial protocols. This strikes at the heart of the globalist project, and they know it. That's why, as we will see, there's a war raging in the crypto world right now between the goal of decentralization and attempts by the global financial system to appropriate and control crypto. But to understand those concepts, we need to first look into what the emerging crypto sphere actually is and what is its present state of development. And that is the subject of the next video, Crypto Basics from Blockchain to the Metaverse. And by the way, 
It's too late to drive Marxism out of the universities. We need to abandon the university system as it is now altogether, starve them out, render the universities obsolete and irrelevant, which they are starting to become anyway. The people can now educate themselves. And it's ironic, because as I pointed out in my presentations on the American Great Awakenings, our universities were direct results of the varieties of the religious experience. All things good and bad come to an end, and it's past time that our once great university system and the education system in general come to an end, along with the global financial system.